Well, the short answer to that is oil. And uh, the next short answer is to do business without feeling as though they are always being circumscribed by the United States in doing business in a region that they feel they have equal access to. And in fact, Russia, unlike China and uh, the United States, feels very much that the Middle East is its own near abroad. It is a borderland to Iran. It's very close to Syria. It's, this is its general region. So it feels as though if it's got, uh, if there's a power that's going to be meddling at all in that region, it really should be Russia itself. And it feels very much as though the United States is a fair weather presence there. It's got its deals with Israel and Saudi, ensuring uh, security on the one hand and energy uh, market, global market energy price control on the other. And basically, it feels as though uh, it's got a lot more right to closer to relationships in uh, the Middle East than the United States does. Uh, China, it just wants to have the mechanisms by which to grow its economy and not be burdened by a whole lot of ideological input and overlay in terms of how it gets its business done. The next question is from the new member, Ted Pearl. While Iran functions as an Islamic Republic, are there pockets of larger groups of secular supporters of the Ahmadinejad government? And if so, how strong are they? Uh, first of all, Ahmadinejad himself is an extremely uh, religious leader. So he is actually not supported by secular groups that much. Um, these days, he certainly does have a following. The regime is quite concerned about his following. He's actually quite millenarian. He has uh, a much more uh, uh, sort of zealotry, actually, uh, aspect to his faith, and feels very much as though only he can interpret what Khomeini really meant in terms of defining the revolution and that it's these other leaders that have, in fact, taken the revolution in the wrong direction. So this is a fight inside the very conservative religious <coughs> camp, and the, and the secularists, in many ways, are not part of that. Now, one more clarification is we really cannot look at the Green Movement as composed primarily of secularists. I was just involved in an Al Jazeera study of what was happening to the you know, 2013 Green Movement, the reformist leaders, the uh, major um, uh, organizers of that movement, and not one of them, in fact, was secular. Most of them were clerical, uh, as is our two of the main leaders of the old Green Movement. So although it inspired a great deal of rhetoric and a lot of what we interpret in the West as very democratic talk. I do want to put in one a clarification about both that and the Arab Spring. We sort of heard all of this as freedom, as social justice, as democracy. But in fact, these are fundamental premises of Islam. We're hearing them through translation. But social justice, which looks at the organization of society, is a fundamental aspect of Islamic dogma. And Islam is a big supporter of consulting and consensus. So in some way, those are democratic practices. It brings everybody in, and then there has to be agreement. And in fact, it's this agreement that is proving, in my view, I'm thinking about writing a piece about this, actually, how, in fact, Islam is sometimes too democratic. Because what we see is that, for example, what we have in Tunisia, let me actually go over to the, go back further to something that most of you probably know better. And that is Arafat's PLO. One of the big problems Arafat ran into was he wanted to include everybody under the PLO because he felt every Palestinian had every right to promote and fight for their country. And so he couldn't bring himself 
to throw out all the violent groups that were the hijackers and the suicide bombers and all of that. It was only when all of that proved to be absolutely no good for the political cause at all that they themselves turned around and said, I guess this isn't a good way. And he finally was able to leave without having that violent way. We're seeing the same thing happen now in Tunisia. I'm not a moderate uh, Islamic Brotherhood party that, is, uh, that was elected to run Tunisia is being plagued at the moment by the fact that there are Salafist groups that are beginning to play a greater role in that, in that political platform. And consensus, that fundamental premise of Islamic practice, means that the leaders of Ennahda so far are not able to say to those who are becoming more violent, more Salafist, you cannot be part of this picture. We will not survive if you continue as part of this picture. So in an unusual sort of reversal of how we think about the Middle East, there are elements of Islam that we might almost think are too democratic for democratic practice. But make no mistake, some of the calls that we heard at the time of the Arab Spring is based on that deep-rooted Islamic approach to community and social justice, uh, and not so much on our democracy promotion and uh, interpretations of freedom. Excuse me, if I, if I can follow this question up with uh, one little aside or, or addendum. What, so does this diffuseness, therefore, act counterproductively towards the idea of a reformation within either the Shia or Sunni elements within Islam? A, a reformation in a Western sense, unless I'm just way off in this idea. You know, I think that's one of the most difficult aspects of trying to explain the one to the other or trying to find common language that works the one to the other. I would say that from a Western perspective, the term Reformation has a very specific meaning in terms of the, the way that Christianity went through its steps and stages. And I have to say that Islam is not going to go through those same steps. It's going through, it's at a different period, it's, it's undertaking change at a very different type, in a very different type of more global world. Uh, and it's going through a very different set of steps and processes. And it's not divided necessarily in terms of uh, within the Shia or within the Sunni. Uh, it's also very much a process of looking at how the entire Islamic world itself is going to function in terms of modernity, in terms of practices. And that's one of the interesting things about the Arab Spring. We're seeing Islamic political parties having to deal with the practicalities of governance. And there's no quicker way to secularize any kind of, of religious party than to put them into a political uh, position of responsibility for their country. Thank you for your clarification, Doctor. I hope it helped. <laughs> it did. The second to last question is from Aza. The question is, do you find it ironic enough that France is supporting jihadists in Syria and yet blasting them in Mali? That is a very good point. Um, however, France is beginning to come around to the idea of beginning to arm the uh, the Syrian opposition. And uh, one has to remember national interests. Why did France go into Mali? Well, there's several issues, and I won't go into all of them. But one of the major ones is that France is a heavy duty nuclear power dependent state for its energy. And where does this uranium come from? Next door, Niger. So it went into Mali to make sure that nothing happened to go across the border and uh, put its own energy uh, into any kind of danger. So one always has to look at the larger picture before one can completely understand what's going on from one country to another. The next question is from Michael Withrow, and it's 
He's asked, as water and oil decline, as women become better educated and thus have fewer children, and as the Sunnis and Shias continue to fight with each other, the Middle East will fall further behind the, the West over the next three decades. Uh, what are your comments or elaborations on this? Well, certainly uh, water is becoming scarce, and um, certainly many of the benefits of oil are uh, becoming more precious to the Middle East itself, whether it's in terms of exporting and therefore not benefiting from, from the energy themselves, or having to use the energy themselves and therefore not having the benefit of the export. So both of those points are interesting um, in terms of their dynamic. One thing that's happening very rapidly is that, particularly North Africa, it, but, well, also the Gulf, they are in extremely sunny locations. And we are rapidly seeing alternative energy collection grids being set up, particularly solar, to try to start uh, contributing to that part of the energy usage uh, as a resource. The uh, question of water is a problematic one. The Sahara is expanding at 20 kilometers, that must be about 15 miles a year. That's significant. I'm not talking feet, I'm not talking meters, miles. And so that is basically a desertification that is having significant effects both in Iraq uh, and part of Syria and Jordan. And in fact, one of the biggest problems of the Syrian uh, conflict in Jordan is there's not enough water to give to the refugees. And when you've got 3,000 refugees pouring across the border every day, it means that this becomes a very dire issue. In Saudi Arabia, water is a real problem, and they're using an enormous amount of petroleum in order to go into desalinization plants. But that means it'll have less oil to export, which may sound crazy for Saudi Arabia. Who cares if they don't have as much to export because they export so much? But believe it or not, two or three decades down the road, most analysts are beginning to think that Saudi Arabia actually will be using so much of its own oil that it will actually not be exporting very much at all. So we are seeing those very same, those very transitions. This is, of course, uh, where the great difficulties that are facing the Middle East arise. The unemployment, which is dire, the youth bulge, which is 40% uh, under the age of 25 or 30, depending on which country you're looking at, but we're basically saying 40% of the Middle East is under the age of 30, and 60% of those people are unemployed, and the majority of highly educated people are unemployed, and women are suffering much, much more than men in those dire figures. And sadly, all projections forward do not see any change in that. So indeed, that is a problem, and youth cause unrest. So what are we looking at? Not possibly a reduction in um, capability over the next three to 30 years, but certainly a lot of unrest. And those countries have got to start knitting together and getting a mechanism that works, and we on the outside are fundamental to helping that work. It's our recession, this global recession, that in many ways triggered the entire Arab Spring. Oddly enough, coinciding with the very moment when we cannot invest there and Europe either because we don't have any money. Our whole democracy promotion program plummeted just at the time that the Arab Spring took off. So we've got to figure out different ways. We have clearly not found the right mechanism so far. Out of the box thinking is where we've got to go because if there's unrest in the Middle East, we suffer. Dr. Biden Farnham, there's a final anonymous question, and that is, to what extent did the Israelis shape U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East? 
the Israelis shape U.S. foreign policy quite a bit in the Middle East, and it's by design. And it's very interesting because that progression has, uh, there's been a progression in that. The support by the United States of Israel really uh, was a strategic decision taken by the Truman and then Eisenhower and finally Kennedy administrations as a solid democracy ally of the United States where missiles could basically be uh, placed that would uh, be usable against the Soviet Union and also intelligence gathering. So it had a very strategic, territorially important position inside the Middle East in terms of American nat nat uh, national interest in terms of fighting communism. When the Soviet Union fell, more or less after the first Gulf War, that purpose went away. Now, what we have forgotten is that up until that particular time, the Israelis and the Iranians actually were not particularly enemies. And the whole uh, Iran-Contra is a very good example of that, because the Israelis were negotiating with the Iranians during that particular period. So that's one of our markers to, to if, if you don't believe me, look at that. But when the Soviet Union fell, when Iraq was no longer the danger to Israel that it had been up until then, and until then it had just kept lobbing various scuds and holding on to various members of the violent Palestinian groups, Israel needed to have a better relationship with the United States in terms of making sure it had some input, some say, as to American strategic understanding of Israel's regional area. And there were two very good ways for it to do that. One was to transfer the animosity that it had felt about, and the, and the fear it had felt about uh, Iraq across the Gulf to Iran. And it was a very good move because there is long, three decades long animosity between the United States and Iran, so that was, you know, that was a no-brainer in a way. So that particular relationship then was able to grow on the fact that the Israelis and the Americans had a common enemy now in Iran. And very much the Israelis are vested in making sure they have a say in how the United States views and addresses this, the uh, uh, challenges of the Middle East region, a region that Israel is not very happy to be in. Uh, and the fact that it is increasingly developing these no man's lands uh, around it and the fence indicates that territorially it is very insecure and therefore relies very heavily on American support and Americans viewing its region through a similar lens. May I have an extra question? Sure, <laughs> sure, sure doctor. Uh, totally opposite to feeling that uh, you have transmitted to us that there is this uh, unstoppable force Islam. There are Islamic intellectuals in France and so on. We have published even a book saying that Islam is not dangerous. It is not adaptable. It cannot spread. In 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 the 14th to, to 17th 18th century. Turks have gone all the way to Vienna, and it all fizzled. They have not been able to convert anyone into Islam because Islamic religion is considered not flexible enough to attract people. The same thing with, uh, with Spain. They have been in Spain for 200, 300 years. They have completely left everything. They have not left any Islam there. So the, these Arab intellectuals are saying that uh, Basically, there is something intrinsic about uh, Islam's philosophy that prevents its uh, acceptance and spread spontaneously, other than by sword. And so, what was your question? <laughs> what? what was the question? Comment. Oh, was comment. My comment. Yes, I, I'm opposing your view. Well, first of all, I'm not so sure. 
and I would hope that the majority of the people in the room have not necessarily heard my argument being that Islam is a, uh, what did you say, an, an unstoppable force. I have looked in some way tonight specifically at one small element of it, sadly one that plays too much on our media uh, and too much on the drama of uh, security, and that is the extremist uh, component. But since you put me up to it, <laughs> I do not think that we, any of us, can simply classify any religion that is has lasted for over 15, 1600 years, that is subscribed to by over a billion people, and that has gone through multiple stages since it knocked on the doors of Vienna. I don't think any of us would really want to be thought of as classifying any religion of that scope as too rigid to be uh, thought of as an organic, living process any more than Christianity, Judaism, or many of the other religions of this world. We are, first of all, enormously lucky to have multiplicity of beliefs and expressions that we do, and we are not ever in a position, I think, to uh, simply write off large groups of belief, people who believe in different ways of interpreting different uh, belief systems. Islam is itself multifaceted, and that certainly was one of the elements I was trying to get over today, because it is only by understanding its multiplicity the difficulty it's having today itself in understanding how to go about the challenges it's facing and our own multiple responses to it, can we have any hope in coming out the wiser and possibly the more secure? Thank you. The next question is from 
longstanding member Santosh Mohanty. What do you believe are Russia and China's interests and goals in the Middle East?